All right, so first of all, x intercepts and y intercepts. Just plugging in 0 for y, 0 for x. A reminder about fractions, if you make a fraction equal to 0, the only place fractions equal to 0 is the numerator is equal to 0. I mean, you could technically multiply both sides by the 2x plus 4 in the denominator, and then it goes away on one side, and you multiply the other side by 0. And so it just becomes 3x plus 1 equals 0, so our x-intercept is negative 1 third. Y-intercept is always way easier to find, plugging in 0 for x, and you get your y-intercept at 1 quarter. So I have those on my graph, and I have them labeled. <coughs> asymptotes, okay? A vertical asymptote is when you're going to have a non-permissible value if that non-permissible value doesn't cancel out, because we learned in grade 12 that any time you have a non-permissible value cancel out, that's where you get a hole in your graph. In this case, our non-permissible value is at x equals negative 2, because that would make us divide by 0. And since that doesn't cancel out by factoring, it becomes a vertical asymptote. And we can also use the limiting process to figure out horizontal asymptotes as x gets really, really big. Right? We can just say the highest powers are the x's. The plus 1 and the plus 4 won't make a difference. And so we get 3 halves as our horizontal asymptote. Now, with that, you would just have your asymptotes and two points labeled. Next, using calculus, we're going to take the derivative. Now, when taking the derivative, you get a quotient rule here. Simplifying it gives you just 10 over 2x plus 4 squared. So in this situation, it does make sense after you've taken the derivative to simplify it because you're going to want to try to find out where is your derivative equal to 0. And after simplifying it, we get 10 over 2x plus 4 squared. And if you set that equal to 0, so if I say 0 equals 10 over 2x plus 4 all squared, Remember that a fraction only can equal 0 if the numerator is equal to 0. Well, the numerator is 10. You can never make 10 equal to 0. And so in this case, the derivative is never equal to 0, and there's no stationary points as a result. There's no maximums, no minimums, no stationary points of inflection. That doesn't mean you can't still do the sine diagram, because remember, in the sine diagram, we also include our non-permissible values. So I put my non-permissible value in for negative 2. I plug in values into my derivative here. So something less than negative 2, something greater than negative 2. But 10 is always positive, and the bottom is squared, which is always positive. It should make sense that in your sign diagram, everything's going to be positive. So this graph is always increasing. Next, you can find your second derivative. Now, with your second derivative, Again, here's another reason it makes sense to simplify your first derivative, because by simplifying your first derivative, your second derivative is easier to calculate, as opposed to trying to do your second derivative with an unsimplified first derivative. Again, we get our second derivative to be negative 40 over 2x plus 4 all cubed. And in this case, again, it's never equal to 0. Because if we set our second derivative equal to 0, the only place a fraction is equal to 0 is if the numerator is equal to 0 and the numerator is equal to negative 40. So it can't equal 0. We have no inflection points. But we can still do our sine diagram for our second derivative because we still have to include our non-permissible values. 
and at our non-permissible value, we see that it changes from being concave up to concave down, but that's not an inflection point because that was our asymptote. So now we can take both of those sine diagrams and now actually graph it. If we look back at what we would have had up till now, you just had your two intercepts and your asymptotes. You know that your graph needs to be increasing and concave up. Does this make sense for this section? Can you see with the asymptotes, the only way you could have it increasing and going up is if it would be in that top section. And in this section, you also need it increasing and going up. And it has to go through those intercepts. So that is the only thing that makes sense. Now, as far as curve sketching goes, we had two points labeled in this section because we had both of our intercepts. I just took a random value and plugged it in to find one point in that section just to give some sort of scale to that part of the graph as well. So let's look at this one. First of all, x-intercepts and y-intercepts. For your x-intercepts, well, you could split this up like you factored it, even though it's not really factoring because it's just splitting things up. e to the x is always a positive graph. If you, like one of the things when I think of e to the x, I think of what does the graph look like? And the fact that it has an asymptote at y equals 0. That means your e to the x graph is always positive and never equal to 0. So the only place this is equal to 0 for an x-intercept is if x is 0. And plugging in 0 for x to find your y-intercept also gives you 0. So we know that we have an x-intercept slash y-intercept at 0, 0. For asymptotes, there's no non-permissible values. But we're going to find out in this graph that we have a partial asymptote. And at this point, you might not have found that out. So using the limiting process, as x gets to a very big positive number, e to the x is big, x is big, times by 2, those are all big numbers. So as x goes to infinity, and we can write the limit as x goes to positive infinity of this function, so I will just define f of x up there so I can cheat a little bit later and not have to write everything. The limit as x goes to infinity for f of x, well, that goes to infinity. Because if I plug in a very large number in for x, everything gets big. And multiplying a bunch of big positive numbers together gives me a big positive value. Now, when we do the limit as x goes to negative infinity of this function, and this is going to explain this partial asymptote of f of x, which is the same as, OK, imagine this limit as x goes to negative infinity. I'm going to rewrite my equation as the 2x on the top and e to the negative x on the bottom. You can do that with an exponent. Your negative exponent rule says you can write an exponent in the denominator if you make it a negative exponent. And the reason I'm doing that is on the top, if I put in a very large negative number, can you see my numerator becomes a very large negative number? And so I'm going to just write equals, my top is going to be negative infinity. And on the bottom, I have e to the negative x. When I plug in a very large negative number, that becomes e to a positive huge number, because I would have negative, negative, big number. And so that would become a very big number on the bottom. And in mathematics, when you do infinity divide by infinity, it's a little bit, you can't just say, oh, it's 1. Sometimes infinity divide by infinity is 1. But sometimes it's equal to 0. And sometimes it's still equal to infinity. 
So we have an issue here, and we're going to find out why this is equal to 0, partially from what we do later on. And I can tell you right now that to figure out which infinity is more powerful, you have to know what's more powerful, an exponential graph or a linear graph. Okay? Would you want, if you had a bank account that could add $2 every month or double every month, what would you choose? Which is more powerful? Right? Oh, I want the $2 more every month. No. Double is better. And so because it's more powerful, the infinity on the bottom is technically bigger, making that go to zero. Okay? But we're going to see that later on as well. So next up, we're going to do our derivatives. Here I've got the second derivative test to find out whether things are going to equal maximums, minimums, or stationary points of inflection. So I take my derivative, and you could use your product rule. This is in factored form already. So after doing your derivative with the product rule, you could factor it. Again, you get a 2e to the x factored out, which is never equal to 0. Your only place where your derivative is equal to 0 is at negative 1. Second derivative as well, figure it out, factored form. The only place it's equal to 0 is at negative 2. And at negative 1, if you plug negative 1 into your second derivative, you get a positive number. And because it's a positive number, it's concave up at negative 1. That makes it a local minimum. That's the second derivative test. We could also find out that it was a local minimum from our first derivative test by plugging negative 1 onto your number line, plugging values back into your first derivative to find out if they're positive or negative. And since it's decreasing before negative 1 and increasing after, you know that at negative 1 you have a local minimum. Now, to find the y-coordinate of that local minimum, you'd have to plug in negative 1 back into your original equation. You'd need your calculator for that. So chances are, if you got this one on an exam to graph, you would do most of it with your graphing calculator. And finally, putting our second derivative our little cyclopses on here. Negative 2 is where it was equal to 0. It does change from concave down to concave up. So we know that that is an inflection point. I'll scroll back down here at the end if you need some stuff, but we're going to look at the graph right now. So what do we do for the graph? We plug in 0, 0. We plug in our minimum, negative 1, negative 0 0.736. And we draw our inflection point. So you would have x-intercept, minimum, and inflection point labeled. Then looking at our sign diagrams, we know it has to be decreasing, then increasing. We also know it has to be concave down, then concave up. Okay. The other thing that I'm going to do is look back at our limit. Okay. And I already said it's equal to 0. Okay. But if you didn't know at the negative infinity over infinity what it was going to equal, Okay? We have two possibilities. We have, well, we have more than, we have actually three possibilities. When you have negative infinity over infinity, you have three possibilities. Possibility one is the infinities are equal 
if they're equal, well, then you would, they'd simplify and you'd get negative 1, okay? That is a little bit of hand-waving because actually there was a 2, so it could be negative some number. But that case usually happens when you have like 2x over 3x or 2x squared over 5x squared. When the things are exactly the same, you get that case, okay? Here we don't have exactly the same kind of thing, so that's not going to happen, but I'll put it down as a possibility. The next thing you could have is you could have the infinity on the top be stronger. If the infinity on the top is stronger, then this would go to negative infinity. And if the infinity on the bottom is stronger, which it is in this case, it'll go to zero and I'll put a negative in front of it, negative zero. I know there's no such thing as negative zero and positive zero, but what I'm trying to imply that it would get close to zero, but because you have a negative number over a positive number, it would have to still be on the negative side of zero if it was getting close to it. The important thing there is we know after this inflection point in this direction, it needs to stay negative. It needs to stay negative and it needs to be decreasing and it needs to be concave down. Can you see that the only way it could be decreasing and concave down and still negatives, negative is if it approached an asymptote there. So using the other information we have, we can conclude, oh, there must be an asymptote at y equals zero. And then here, it's concave up and goes up forever. So the calculus tells us some stuff, but we still need a fair bit of logic and thinking and an analyzing the graph to figure out exactly what's going to be happening in a more complicated situation like this. The positive is that on your exam, to get these y-coordinates, you need a calculator. And if you need a calculator on an exam, this type of question, you could type into your calculator, get the graph off your calculator, find your maximums and minimums. Usually on a question like this, they give a specific domain, like graph this one from negative 3 to positive 3. So whenever a specific domain is given for graphing, you need to make sure that you label the endpoints as well as your intercepts, maximums, minimums, points of inflection. All right, I will scroll it back down in case you need. We're looking at writing some more of this. Do you want to go up a little bit? Is this good? <laughs> 